when then you say that God decreed the fall, the question is, you, you know, you use the exact terminology, he could sin or not sin. That is the definition of libertarian freedom, the, the contra-causal ability to do otherwise. And so are you saying Adam could have resisted the temptation to eat of the fruit, Adam and Eve? So um, thank you for uh, your respectful uh, critique of my position. So I want to make a, a scholastic distinction. Our scholastics make a distinction between God's permissive will and his positive will. So we would say that God ordains good and evil, but not in the same sense. So when God ordains good, that means the good is actually from God. God because of God's essence, because God's essence is infinite goodness, God cannot produce any evil. The Westminster Confession is very clear. God is not the author of evil. Um, so when we say that God ordains something that is evil, it means that the evil or rather the deprivation of good, because uh, according to like metaphysically evil, it doesn't have a substance. Evil is just a deprivation of good the same way cold is a deprivation of heat and darkness is a depri deprivation of light. So when we say that God ordains something evil, it means that the evil is already there and God molds it according to his purposes such that it might be overcome with good. One of my favorite verses in the whole Bible is Genesis 50, where it says, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. So God actually had an intention for that evil thing happening. And there are passages of scripture that say in some sense, um, God ordains evil events. Lamentations 3.38 says, is it not from the mouth of the Most High that both calamities and good things come? Job 2.10 says, um, we take the good days from God, why not also the bad days? And in some sense, you can say both God did it and Satan did it when it comes to the evils that Job was dealing with. So when we talk about God's permissive will, we have to understand this in the context of original sin, which is that all people already deserve hell. So anything bad that happens to us in this life is less bad than hell. So that means God is not being unjust by causing any evil things because evil is just a deprivation of good in everything. And everything that happens to us here, God is giving us more than we deserve. Yeah. I'm wondering, because you kind of go into a different topic, you kind of went over the permissive will of God in Genesis 50. Um, and now you're kind of moving into original sin and what we deserve. Um, both of those are great topics. And so I thought maybe if if I kind of jump in on on the permissive yeah. will portion, because permissive is one of our favorite words um, it, it, when it comes to permission. What are you permitting if not the free will of <laughs> choices of men and women? And so um, for God to permit something means that's something he did not bring to pass. He's permitting something to happen. So if, if somebody else is about to do something and I don't intervene to stop them, I'm permitting them to do it. I'm allowing them to do it. I mean, I didn't want them to do it but I'm, I'm not stopping them from doing it. It's not coming from me where that seems to find the face of at least what John Calvin taught with regard to, he even actually comes down and says they've people obtusely, you know, per, you know, uh, he, he condemns people for even inventing the word permission when it comes to God's decree. And, and there's quotes about that. But again, I'm not trying to say that you're like Calvin in every regard or anything like that. But earlier in your opener, you did, you did say that he planned it when the girl broke up with you, he planned this, and you use J.K. Rawlings as your example, where does J.K. Rawlings ever permit something in his book? You see what I'm saying? He he had to, he wrote it. And that again, I'm not trying to nitpick your analogy, but it just seems to not really fit that analogy to say that J.K. Rawlings just permitted Harry Potter to do X, Y, Z or somebody that he wrote in his book because that has to be coming from somewhere, right? Real quick, I think that Richard probably knows what I'm going to say. I just don't want us misgendering people in their actual gender. Uh, J.K. Rowling, Rowling she, is, yeah, is, she is a woman, sorry, yeah. but but hey, yeah. that probably gives you points that you didn't know that, Flowers. <laughs> yeah, so. I don't know Harry Potter. I was hoping Tolkien would come up because he, he's my he's my usual, usual you example with Tolkien, this one. You use Tolkien for the analogy Tolkien. if you like. I like the author analogy. <laughs> I got you. Well, I, I'll let you respond to that, uh, but yeah. Yeah, so uh, we would say that in some sense, yes, God does decree both. And John Calvin's distaste for the word permissive, it depends on how you're using the term permissive. If you're using it to say that God is hands off in any sense, of course, any good Calvinist would oppose that. Uh, when we say permissive or positive, we distinguish between those two decrees because one of them is actually in accordance with God's divine essence and one of them is not. So it is possible for God to, in some sense, assign a role for an evil event for the teleological purpose of having that eventually lead to a greater good. It does not violate God's divine essence 
to do that. It does not violate God's divine essence to a allow the fall to happen if God knows that it's going to bring about the greater good of redemption. So did, do you believe God allowed the fall or decreed the fall or both? I would, I would say, I would say both. So we would say that God is the first cause of all events. That's classic, you know, Thomas Aquinas. God is the first cause of all events. And whenever, when God, whenever God sets the universe into motion, he knows that based on the starting conditions he set it with, he knows everything that's going to happen. And he intervenes here and there, but he knows everything that's going to happen. So he started the universe with a specific plan, a specific end for the universe in mind. And if God can assign certain events that are not good to achieve that, that end, that does not contradict his divine essence to do so. Okay. So again, when you would, when then you say that God decreed the fall, the question is, you, you know, you use the exact terminology, he could sin or not sin. That is the definition of libertarian freedom, the, the, the contra-causal ability to do otherwise. And so are you saying Adam could have resisted the temptation to eat of the fruit, Adam and Eve? From an earthly perspective, yes, because there was no force in this world that was preventing Adam from doing so. We would say that according to God's providence, no, you can't go against God's providence, but God is not operating on the same level of existence that we are. So I would appeal back to the author analogy. I don't know. Could, I don't know. Could Frodo have not have decided not to go to Mordor from the perspective of the Lord of the Rings universe? Yes, he could have done that from our perspective. No, that's not how the book was written. So from God's perspective, well, no, Adam. Okay, well, Tolkien, Tolkien caused it by writing him to do that. And so you're saying, it sounds like you're saying that God wrote Adam to sin. Well, yes. So the distinction I would make is that Frodo did have free will to climb up the mountain in Mount Doom in Mordor. Because I, I think Christians like Lord of the Rings. So if, if Tolkien says he climbed up the mountain, you're saying that's free will because he's... Because I, 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 that doesn't because follow. From, from the perspective of his universe, Frodo's universe, from the perspective of the Lord. So he thinks universe, he has free will, but he's really being authored. He could have done otherwise. However, in when he tries to cast the ring into the lava and he can't do it, he does not have free will in that respect because there is something in his own universe act actively preventing him from doing so. So I would say we do not have free will on our own without God's um, effectual calling to come to faith because there is something within our own universe preventing okay. us from doing that. And that is our original sin. Okay. No, again, I, I don't try, I'm not trying to nitpick, but I, I just see so many problems, Who's obviously, nitpick? and would reject, obviously, the, the, the analogy, the analogy, that's why we're here. Um, because it just sounds like to me, him, Frodo is a, a figment of his imagination. Obviously, he's not a cynic being that's being judged by uh, Tolkien for doing what he authored him to do. And, and that would have to be the case if you're going to carry that over to the analogy of human beings, because if, if God authors me to, uh, you know, lust after a woman and then judges me for lusting out of a woman after a woman, then the, you, you talk about the deserving of hell. Um, if it's something that I, it's not within my control to resist that temptation, then I, I don't see any true desert as far as uh, the definitions of what uh, human accountability would would require and that would be the ability to to resist the temptation as first corinthians 10 13 that that he will not tempt you beyond what you can bear but you'll be able to resist it that's an example of a libertarian free choice when you fall into temptation you could have done otherwise just like adam could have done otherwise um well he couldn't have done other than what god authored him to do according to the, the very analogy you're giving as far as i can tell Okay, so um, first of all, do you are you an open theist? No. Okay, good. Um, so you believe that God knows every single event that's going to happen, right? I, I believe God has knowledge of all things. Yes. He knows specifically what is going to happen in the future. Well, he knows it because he's omnipresent. God, I use C.S. Lewis's view. He's at all. He's at. He's at. Present. He's present at all places and all times. So he knows it because he witnesses it. He's aware of it, not because he causes it or decrees it or authors it before it happens. So when God created the universe, when God set the universe in the motion, into motion, when God created Adam and Eve, did he know, did he create them knowing that they were going to fall? 
um, not in the same sense that we would know something like a crystal ball looking into the future. And this is where we get into the philosophical issues of what we would call the eternal now perspective or with Boethius and the writing of the constellation of philosophy back in the sixth century and his, um, his, his depositing of outside of time and all those kinds of things, as well as the Molinist arguments, um, including the dynamic perspectives that are put out there, all of which are trying to answer the question is how does God's knowledge work within time and space? I don't, I don't, I don't have a problem appealing to the mystery with how God knows what I will do in the future. Um, freely, just like Jesus didn't determine Peter to die three times before the rooster crowed, just because he told him he would, he, he told him he would because he has knowledge of the future, not because he determines the future. And so, um, I don't believe knowledge is causal. In other words, there's a difference between certainty and necessity. You can know for certain something's going to happen without being the one who necessitates the thing that happens. And so again, that gets into a lot of the philosophical side of things. Um, you can, you can know sub, you, you can know sub the beliefs that something's true without knowing how it's true. I believe that God knows our future free choices. I don't know how, just like, I don't know how he created something from nothing. And so I would, I would, I would appeal to the mystery of that particular question with regard to how God knows what we will do in the future. I do not conclude that the only way he knows it is by determining it. 